All right, we're gonna get started, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good? Cool? Oh. Uh, great, well, thank you everyone for joining us again for another BCM Wednesday webinar. Uh, I am joined today with Laura Peasley, um, physical therapist here at Pursuit uh, Physical Therapy in South Portland. And um, we're gonna talk today a little bit about um, bike fit and you know how how that works coming from a physical therapist, the difference between you knowing that and what you get a bike shop and all kinds of fun things like that. Uh, but first, before we get started, uh, I just want to say thank you for joining and also thank you to uh, um, joining the Wednesday webinar series is brought to us by Tandem Coffee. Uh, Tandem Coffee has sponsored us this year. So if you're down in Portland, swing by Tandem Coffee, uh, a little plug right there for you. Um, but yeah, uh, well, everyone, welcome. And uh, Laura, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Um, my name is Laura Peasley. Um, I received my doctor in physical therapy from University of New England in 2012. Um, and as a physical therapist, uh, I was working a lot with cyclists to help them rehab their injuries, help them get back on their bike and back to life. And I felt like I was missing a big piece of the puzzle to help them get back on their bike and not have their symptoms just return. Uh, so I went through the Serata International Cycling Institute bike fitting program to be able to become a bike fitter, to be able to really provide everything that a cyclist needs to be able to um, bike comfortably, not have pain, prevent injuries, improve their performance. Uh, so that's a big part of what I do at Pursuit Physical Therapy is I'm able to provide the physical therapy uh, for acute injuries, chronic issues, um, and then also do the professional bike fitting. Uh, so it can really make a big difference in people's enjoyment on the bike, people's comfort. Um, if they have pain on the bike, like very common issues are knee pain, back pain, neck pain, uh, hands that go asleep, feet that go asleep, saddle pain, saddle sores, all those things. Um, it's a very complicated process. Uh, it's like three hours long, but we can we can really dive down to the nitty gritty, gritty details and figure out what's that person needs based on their anatomy, their flexibility, their stability, um, and what specific uh, diagnoses they have. Awesome. Um, I should, we should probably start the slideshow right now, shouldn't we? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're going to have a slideshow here that uh, we're going to talk through and that Laura has so kindly made for us. So I'm just going to bring it up here real quick. There it is. Excellent. Can everyone see that? Please give me a thumbs up. Excellent. Cool. Awesome. I got at least one, so I'm calling that a win. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I think this is kind of sums up right here. Um, but yeah. So well, what's your cycling history? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, so biking is my favorite thing. Um, <laughs> so to be able to help cyclists has been really rewarding and fun at the same time. So I'm a cyclist myself. Um, I love all disciplines of cycling. So I do road biking, gravel biking, mountain biking. Um, I do the Try for a Cure every year. Um, so I also work a lot with triathletes as well. Um, so for a fitting perspective, um, I'm certified in doing fits for people that um, have a mountain bike, gravel bike, road bike, uh, triathlon or TT bike. And I also do home visits for Peloton or spin bike fits um cool so and it says you are certified through the serata international cycling institute is that the same serata like frame builder mm -hmm. okay yes yep cool awesome should i move ahead sure cool ah there we go is that right yeah that's cool. perfect um so what is bike fitting um at Pursuit, it's a three, three and a half hour process. So it involves many steps, which we'll go over each of those. And the goal is to improve your comfort, your performance, your efficiency, and also help prevent issues down the road and um, improve your bike handling and responsiveness. So those are all things that if you have good balance and good symmetry on your bike, that's gonna help um, with all those things. 
Um, so like I said before, I, I do the road gravel, triathlon, TT bikes, mountain bikes, and the Peloton um, home spin bikes. And the five phases include the interview, uh, the physical assessment, the bike fit itself, and then we go over based on what we find with the physical assessment and the bike fit, customized mobility, stability work, things that you can work on at home that will further improve your comfort on the bike. Um, and then about six to eight weeks later, we always do a follow up. So we want to ensure that your issues are resolved. If you have any new components installed, like let's say you need new handlebars. So we go over and make sure the hood's in the right position. How's the handlebar rotation? Do we need to make any other adjustments based on your new components? Um, so those are the five phases. Cool. Um, so I mean, this is a three hour process. Is there like a particular part of it that takes like the most time or is it, you know, when that's more in depth? Yeah, so I'd say the assessment, the physical assessment, um takes a good hour okay and then the bike fit uh, about an hour and a half and then the customized um exercises uh, about like a half hour okay so something along those lines um i i do um in my schedule plan for three and a half hours in case some some things just take longer. Um, some people are pretty pretty quick. Some people are more complex and need more time. Um, so okay, yeah. But I always it almost always goes that three hours. Okay, and when people come, do you usually bring like one bike? Do they bring multiple bikes? That's a good question. So um, the three three and a half hours is for one bike, um, and then if it's a completely different bike, that bike fit is going to be different. Like there's no way you could take the final measurements from a road bike and put it on your mountain bike. Um, so that's a whole nother appointment um, for, okay. for that. But if it's just, if you have two road bikes, um, you can bring in both road bikes and then we're able to, to do that um, pretty quickly. I do extend the appointment, um, but. Cool. Yeah, awesome. it's not apples to apples. <laughs> <laughs> All right, should we move forward? Sure. Awesome. I'm not sure which one is the right. Uh, should be, I believe, the assessment. Or, sorry, the All right, yeah, I, 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 I think click the screen, that makes it easier. <laughs> All right, so when you schedule a bike fit, um, especially if you do it on my website, it automatically sends you this intake form. So I'm able to get some really good information before we really meet um, about your, you know, your goals, what are your symptoms on the bike, um, what do you do for biking? Like what, are, what's your typical routine? Like, so I'm, I have all the information before we meet, but then during this like interview, like get to know you, we dive a little bit deeper. So we talk a lot about if you have a current injury, you know, how long have you had that injury? Um, where is your pain? When do you notice the pain on the bike? So is it more, um, after biking for let's say an hour or is it more when you're going up a hill or having to push uh, with harder efforts um have you had treatment for it before have you had any imaging all those sorts of things and then also have you had any past injuries so it's really good for me to know as a pt you know have you fractured your collarbone before have you sprained your ankle have you had a uh, knee surgery, like a meniscectomy and things like that, because that's going to hone me in on things to look for in a bike fit and what might need to be altered and modified with your bike fit to help decrease that strain and stress on that particular um, area. Um, so we talk a lot about injury history um, and what you're currently feeling on the bike. And then we talk about what you typically do on the bike. So do you do multiple disciplines, the road and mountain? And then if this is per se a road bike fit, um, do you have the similar symptoms on the mountain bike or is that totally different? Um, talk about, do you have any upcoming events or races and what that looks like? Um, do you follow a certain training program? Do you work with a coach or do you or have like a training peaks or anything like that? Um, and then what are your strengths and weaknesses on the bike? So, you know, is a strength climbing or is that a weakness, um, cadence, um, things like that. Um, 
goals. So that's a huge part of, you know, come for a bike fit. What are your goals? Is it to improve your comfort? Is it that you currently don't have pain on the bike, but you want to avoid an injury? Or you really want to maximize your performance and efficiency on the bike. So it's really important for me to know those things. And a lot of times it's a combination of those things. Um, and then it's good for me to know what you do that's not biking. So <laughs> do you do strength training? Do you do any mobility work? Um, what, what kind of um, cross training things do you do? Do you run? Do you do yoga? And then are you employed? And if so, what do you do for work? Um, someone who has a desk job and is sitting a lot versus let's say someone who's a construction worker and using their body all day long, um, how they look on and off the bike um, will be different depending on what they do for work. Interesting, cool. All right, so this is where the fun begins. <laughs> um, so, Looking at your alignment. So everyone is different. We as humans are asymmetrical, right? No one is perfectly symmetrical. So it's good for me to figure out what your alignment is off the bike. So I know when we get you on the bike, is that a bike fit issue or is it just your skeleton and how you're built? So I look at things like, is one foot more pronated or rolled in than the other foot? Do your knees come together or do they go apart? So that's called varus or valgus. Um, how is your back? Or do you have a pretty flat back or does your back have the natural curves? Uh, do you have scoliosis, meaning like does your spine curve side to side? Or do you have kyphosis? Like do you have a little bit of like extra curvature in your upper back? That's important for me to know because if you go on the bike and you're really hunched like this, um, that could potentially be just how you are. It might not be that the bike is too small for you or whatnot. Um, uh, then we look further up, I look at your shoulder blades. Do you have winging of your shoulder blades, meaning are they up off your rib cage? Um, just statically, how, how do they rest on your rib cage? Is one shoulder higher than the other? Um, how's your neck um, curvature? Do you have a little bit curvature in your neck or is it is it is that what we call lordosis flattened out? Um, look even at your elbows. So when you straighten out your elbows, do your elbows really kind of bow out to the side or are they pretty straight? That's gonna potentially change how your hands are on the on the handlebars. Um, so really very thorough head to toe assessment of just looking at your alignment off the bike. Um, and then we look at your mobility, flexibility, strength, and stability. So mobility, some things that are really important for being able to be comfortable on a bike is, for instance, your hip mobility. So um, if, if I were to check your hip flexion, how much can you bring your knee up towards your chest without your knee coming out? Um, and does that create any pinching or any pain in the front or the back of the hip? Um, so that's important for when you're on the bike to be able to clear the top of the pedal stroke and keep everything in a straight line and not have your hip and knee turn outwards. Um, so hip mobility, spine mobility, um, how well does your spine move? So looking at how well it moves, but also the quality of movement. So let's say, have you been forward? Do you come straight down or do you tend to shift off to one side? So you know, when you go on the bike and I have you, uh, have your hands on the hoods, are you, are you twisted like that? Well, is that kind of how you're, how you're built and how your nervous system is, or is it something with the bike fit itself? Um, so we look a lot at hip mobility, um, spine mobility, ankle mobility, um, knee mobility, and then flexibility. So a big one is hamstring length. So, I check hamstring length with my hand under the small of the back and then keep the knee straight, raise the leg up. And when I start to feel that pelvis tilt back into my hand, I know that that's the end of, the tr of your true hamstring length and otherwise your spine will start to compensate. So that's really important because when you're on the bike, you wanna be able to have your pelvis roll forward. And if your hamstrings are really tight, um, you're lacking flexibility there they're actually gonna pull you back and that's gonna make it harder for you to reach the bars, engage your glutes, all those things. Um, 
So let's see, strength and stability. So a lot of cyclists, um, we spend our time in a flex position um, and our body moves in a lot of other planes. So we tend to get stiff, like let's say with spinal rotation or extension or even side bend. So I look at um, the mobility, but also the stability of how well can you stabilize through your core? How well is your hip stability? Um, because we're always moving in just a forward plane, we tend to develop weakness in like our rotational strength and stability. So um, looking at, at cyclists, going back to the assessment, I look to see, uh, do you have well-developed glutes or are you pretty much like no, no, no bum. Um, and then also looking at your muscle bulk is one side more than the other. Like that would tell me that you might have a strength uh, asymmetry with that. Um, so core stability, um, do some testing to look at how well you can stabilize your core. Um, hamstring strength as well. Sometimes I see cyclists that are very, very quad dominant and they have uh, significant weakness in their hamstrings. So I go to test their hamstring strength. Um, their quads are extremely strong, but their hamstrings are could definitely use some strength training and that will affect uh, their pedal stroke. So, and then um, based on where you had the pain um, and have an injury, we go a full um, diagnostic assessment into that, into that um, area. So figuring out if you haven't had a diagnosis made, um, figure out what exactly is going on. So if you have knee pain, is it um, an issue with a patellofemoral joint or do you have distal IT band syndrome or could you potentially have a meniscus tear? Um, so it's important to know what is going on um, so that when we, we get to the bike fitting, I know what things that, um, we need to really hone in on and focus on. So figuring out exactly what's going on is really important. So after all that, um, then we start to look a little bit more at the bike specific things. So I have you bring in your cycling shoes and um, I like to just take, before I even have you put them on and things like that, just look at, is there any um, abnormal like wear pattern? So like, is there a lot of creasing on the inside of the shoe? That might tell me that you- Should I stop the screen share for you? So if you can see. Oh sure. yes, please. <laughs> oh, back there. All right, there we go, cool. Okay. <laughs> Um, so looking at the bike shoe, I look for any abnormal wear pattern. So for instance, the inside of the cycling shoe, are there a lot of creases there? That might tell me that you might be over pronating or your foot might be really collapsing down in the shoe. Um, we pull out the sock liner and look to see if you have any abnormal wear in the sock liner, meaning like, is it just like the big toe that I see or do I see pretty equal wear throughout the foot? Um, is there e even some space between the toes to the end of the sock liner? Are you right at the end? Can I see your fifth toe or is, is that like off the sock liner, meaning like you might be in a shoe that's too narrow for you? Um, I feel and make sure the bolts are not poking through. Um, it's actually quite common that people might be on bolts that are too long. Mm. And if they're having like foot numbness, that can be a part of that. So I make sure the bolts are not um, sticking through with that. Um, and then I actually measure your foot. So I have a Brannock device. So we look at um, what your what your foot length is, what your width is um, in both non-weight bearing and weight bearing position to see how much your foot changes when you actually bear weight through it. Um, so one that's a huge factor with bikes that I feel like is very much overlooked is the, how well the shoe fits and then the position of your cleat on the shoe. So that's where we transfer our power through. So it's really important to have that a really good, strong, stable, supportive base um, to be able to transfer your power through. 
when we walk, when we run, our foot acts as a spring, but when we're on the bike, it's a lever. So it's really important to not be over pronating in the shoe or have a shoe that's actually too narrow for you and it, it creates instability in the shoe. So we spend a lot of time making sure you're on the right shoe. And if you're not, give you suggestions for, for what is needed. Um, very commonly, I see people that uh, the shoe is too narrow. Mm -hmm. Um, literally have them step in their sock liner and their fifth metatarsal. So the outside of their foot is off the sock liner. So there are some brands that um, are better for having like a wider toe box. So like Lake, uh, CD Mega, Bont um, typically have mm. a wider toe box for those, for those folks. I have a pair of Adidas uh, cycling shoes. I have a really nice toe box. Like I spent like a mm. long time trying to find a pair of shoes that actually did because I have a wide foot myself. Mm -hmm. and I noticed like my key thing is my foot always got cold in the winter. Mm. So I feel like I wasn't getting enough circulation from a tight toe box. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So that can be a huge factor for, you know, that or like numbness and tingling because a lot of our nerves and vasculature run between our metatarsals. Um, our foot so if you're getting that squeezed um that's not fun <laughs> so um let's see what else oh so going back to power transfer one thing that um if you do over pronate so if your foot is collapsing down in the shoe and you're not getting good contact area through there and it's creating some instability um one thing that i do offer are these g8 orthotics um which I love, they come from Australia because they come with five different arch heights. Oh. So you can really customize what you need depending on what your foot structure is. Um, and a lot of times two feet are not the same. <laughs> um, and then you can also move uh, that arch support forward and aft, so forward and back and then in and out to really match um the structure of your foot so i've had really good luck with these um they also have some things that you can add to them like metatarsal domes that help spread out your metatarsals that can help with with um pain in your forefoot or numbness even um and then some um varus and valgus wedges at the heel so if your heel as your pedaling is turning in or out that helps to stabilize that so these are highly customizable so i really like having those as an option for people. Um, Do you feel like people think much about like their feet and shoes like that when they do a bike fit or buy a bike or do you think it's kind of an afterthought sometimes? Um, I think it's definitely an afterthought. I think it's something that is definitely kind of overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people, I, I always ask people, did you put these cleats on in any particular way? And they're like, no, I just kind of threw them on. <laughs> um, so yeah, I spent a lot of time getting that right for them. Um, so the next thing that we look at off the bike is that fore and aft of the cleat position. Mm -hmm. So um, cleats can move different ways, right? So they can move fore and aft, they can move in and out, and they can also rotate. So off the bike, we we figure out where that fore and aft position needs to be. Depending on what that looks like on the bike, we might make some micro adjustments, but we always wanna make sure that it's either in line with the ball of the foot or a little bit behind that. You never want that cleat um, in front of the ball of the foot. So we find the ball of the foot and then match up the center of the cleat, which there's always like these little notches on the sides of the cleat um, to indicate the center of the cleat, line that up. Um, yeah cool um and then um looking at the bike so Should I bring up the sure okay <laughs> almost that was screen share come on there we go there we go all right so um, then we put the bike on my trainer. So I use the Wahoo rollers, um, which I like because it allows a little bit of movement of the wheel, of the rear wheel on the trainer. So you're not completely locked in. Um, so then we take pre-measurements. So I know what we're starting with. So for instance, um, look at your crank arm lengths. We look at your saddle height, saddle setback, saddle tilt. 
um, the XY position to the handlebars, your, your stem length, stem size, handlebar width, handlebar reach, um, all of that. <laughs> I'm probably missing a bunch of things off the top of my head. Um, and then I like to look at for any wear patterns or asymmetry within the bike. So are, uh, is there a crank rub on your chain stay or on your crank arm? Um, is there, where's the bar, where's the wear on your bar tape? Um, that gives me an idea of where you tend to hold your hands. Um, is the stem even straight? Is the nose straight? Um, are the hood angles the same? It's very often like I'll see one more turned in, someone like crashed and forgot to re, uh, re-straighten them. Um, look at the pedals themselves. So are there any abnormal wear in the pedal? And that can tell me that you might be either your foot might be um, putting more pressure on the outside or the inside. Um, and then we take a pre-photo and video. So I like to do that because it gives the person something to look at for this is where you start and this is where you ended up. Um, so we take a, a photo and a video of them cycling. So. Cool. So asking for a friend, mm -hmm. uh, crank rub, mm -hmm. <laughs> what is, uh, I know, what is that usually a sign of? Is that a sign of like, um, like pedals being too close to the crank arm? Is mm -hmm. it something about like alignment with the knee? Yeah, so it can mean that your stance width is too narrow. Oh, okay. Um, it can mean that your um, cleat rotation, like if you have your cleat too far rotated mm -hmm. in, that's going to turn your foot out. Um, and if that's too much, um, that can hit the the um, the crank. Oh, okay. Um, or sometimes, like if someone's got like a really like old. Um, um pedal um that like has created some like instability in that okay. um or if the cleat itself is loose that can cause that so yeah, multiple reasons but we figure out what exactly is going on with during the bike fit cool okay awesome all right so as the cyclist is warming up i just like to look at generally what they look like. So I look at um, their ankling or or how their ankle is moving. So are they really like pointed down at the bottom of, of the pedal stroke? Are they dropping their heel beyond neutral? Um, what does their knee look like? Is it nice and smooth over the bottom of the pedal stroke or does it look choppy? Um, where they're sitting on the saddle. So sometimes I'll see people with like an inch or two off the back of the saddle and they're gravitating towards the nose of that saddle. That can be due to many reasons. Um, how well are they able to roll their pelvis forward? What does their spine look like? Um, are their shoulders hunched and rolled forward or are they um, retracted and look like they're kind of jammed up through their shoulders? Um, what's their wrist angle like? Are their wrists turned in, turned out? Um, how's their knee tracking from the frontal plane? So looking from the front, is one knee going in and one knee's going out? Are they both going in or out? Or are they like pistons moving straight up and straight down? Uh, so I just make note of general observations before we start breaking everything down. Um, so one of the first things I look at is the cleat rotation. So before getting on the bike, we set up the cleats so that make sure they're over the ball of their foot or slightly behind. But now it's important to look at the rotation. So off the bike, one thing that I, I didn't mention, but I look at to see when you stand, when you walk, when you squat, do your, do your feet tend to turn out or do they tend to turn in or do you hold them straight? So typically that can be your bony alignment creates that or it can be co compensatory. But when you're on the bike, we don't wanna be pulling you out of what you naturally do. So we want to make sure if you are slightly towed out, want to make sure you're not pedaling at the end of your float. So I actually will have people pedal around and stop at the bottom and top of the pedal stroke and make sure that you're able to slightly tow out so that you're not fighting that. Um, so and vice versa, if you're slightly towed in, you might have to have your cleat slightly rotated out. Um, then we look at the saddle height. Um, so saddle height has a lot to do with the 
at the bottom of the pedal stroke, how smooth that transition is of the knee from extension into flexion. So if the saddle height is too high, which I see very commonly, people are gonna lose control of their knee at the bottom of a pedal stroke where their hamstrings aren't able to control that um, and their quads take over. So you'll see a lot of choppiness, like the knee quickly decelerates um, at the bottom of the pedal stroke. So there's ranges with like, um, you know, what your knee extension should be at the bottom of the pedal stroke, but it's all very specialized to every individual and what they look like on their bike, um, given their flexibility and um, their anatomy and things like that. So um, after the saddle height, um, look at the saddle shape and size. So I look to see where you're sitting on the saddle, are your sit bones on the widest part of the saddle? And is one sit bone like off the saddle um, or are they both off the saddle or are your sit bones like here and the saddle goes all the way to here. Um, so we look at that and then also just the, the general shape of the saddle. So some saddles have like very wide wings here. So as I'm looking from the back, do I see these wings like digging into the person's like inner thigh or are they able to, to clear that um, nicely and, and I'm not seeing any excessive pressure. Um, so there's a lot of um, different um, variabilities between saddles. So for instance, one thing that we do look at is this is the saddle width. So where are you sitting on the saddle and where are your sit bones? Um, also look at the kick of the saddle. So that's how much like the pitches in the back. So that helps to roll your pelvis forward. Um, so especially if you're an aggressive rider, sometimes that can be helpful. Um, we look at the width of the nose itself. So some noses can be more narrow than, or than others. Um, we look at the cutout or channel for the pressure relief. Um, and then also too, like the material of the saddle, like um, is it soft, is it hard? And then how much does that saddle flex? So these are all things that it's, it's, it's can be somewhat of an experiment of being like, okay, the saddle that you're on right now is either too too narrow or too wide for you, but then there's all these other variables that we need to play around with. So if you're very uncomfortable in a saddle with a lot of pitch, then we might try something that's a little bit more flat. Um, or if you're uncomfortable with a saddle, like let's say like with a longer nose and you tend to be an aggressive rider, meaning you really can roll your pelvis forward and, and tend to get pretty low, um, maybe a shorter nose saddle or something like that can be helpful. Um, so after looking at that, we look at your saddle setback. Um, so how far back your saddle is over the bottom bracket. Um, that all has to do with balance. Um, so let's say I see a cyclist that has a really, you know, big head, broad shoulders, um, long torso, um, or females that are like well endowed, they're probably going to need their saddle set back more so than if someone is really small upper body, small head, um, they can usually ride their, their saddle a little more forward, but it's a balancing act, right? So if you have your saddle too far forward, you tend, tend to put more pressure onto your hands. Um, and then that can also make your rear wheel a little squirrely. Um, too far back, we'll do the opposite. So it's finding out where that person is most um, balanced over their bottom bracket, um, where they don't have too much weight on their saddle uh, versus their handlebars. So, um, and then we can also play with the saddle tilt. So um, typically you want your nose to be parallel, but occasionally you do want it down a couple degrees, especially if you're really good at rolling your pelvis forward and getting into that aggressive position. Um, very rarely do you want your nose up. I know Brooks saddles and things like that. Some, some of those are made for that, but with like more traditional saddles, um, that's going to create some issues. <laughs> um, so what's interesting is that you change one thing with that, and then often you have to change something else. So if I really need to change the setback, then I need to go back and I need to reassess the saddle height, things like that. Um, so once we get the saddle in the correct position and the person's on the correct saddle for them, we look at the reach. So 
a lot of that has to do with their neck and shoulder position. So I'm sure you've seen people on bikes where their shoulders are like rolled forward and their elbows are locked out to try to help them reach the bars. Um, that's a very good indicator that the reach is too long um, or their side of the handlebar drop is too excessive. Versus the opposite, if someone is, their shoulders are retracted, so if their shoulder blades are like pushed back and they're trying to drop their chest lower, that's an indicator that they potentially might be too close and we need to extend that reach. I'm gonna just stop the screen share real quick. Sure. So while you're explaining that, because I think Lauren has some great like visuals of what to look for here. Yeah, bit. okay. So, sorry, I forget that you can't <laughs> see me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for someone with an excessive reach, so a reach that's too long for them, you'll often see that their shoulders are rolled forward and their shoulder blades are protracted, meaning they're pushed forward on their rib cage. They'll tend to lock out their elbows um, because they're trying to, to get closer um, to the bars. Um, versus the opposite, if someone's too close, you'll actually see their scapula retract and then they're trying to drop their torso down further, um, but they can't because their hands are on the handlebars and locked into position. So a lot of that reach and saddle handlebar drop, meaning like, you know, how many spacers you have, what's the angle of your stem, um, have to do with um, how your, how your body is able to be positioned on the bike. So kind of typical rule of thumb is like if you're um, at about 90 degrees with your elbows slightly bent, that's like a good starting point um, because that way the forces are going up into the, your joints and not so much like into your soft tissue. But everything else has to be positioned correctly for that angle to be right. So it's I don't, I don't really like to go with, with um, always with angles. It's really about how things look mechanically and how you feel. Um, so. Well, I think the saddle you're talking about before too, because we weren't on here, uh, the saddle right here, just talking about the width right here, right? Something like that. Yeah, yep. So talking about um, the width of the saddle, the kick, how much of a pitch there is. Um, how quickly to the saddle tapers uh, is another key factor. And then is there a channel or cutout, um, the width of the nose, the material, how much it flexes. Those are all components of what we look at. Oh, super cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's a lot of what I explained looking from the side view. Yeah. Um, so now we look at more of the front view. So for me, um, one of the things that we look at is your handlebar width. So if we're talking about a road bike, um, if this is your chromium here, the tip of your shoulder blade, where is the rest of your arm in respect to that? So if you're too wide, people will tend to roll their wrists out because their their elbow wants to stay in line with their shoulder. Um, or if you're too narrow, your wrist can curl in and then that can make it really difficult to breathe. So one thing I do measure in the assessment is shoulder width um, so that we have a baseline of, of what that potentially could be, but then it also depends on what it looks like on the bike. Um, so going back to this. So this is one thing that I have um, that can be very helpful. So, um, say you're really extending your wrists, um, your elbows are in, but then your wrists are f further away from you and your shoulder, um, width was measured to be, let's say, uh, 38 and you're on like 42 handlebars. So we put these on your bike and then are able to see how that how your alignment changes and how you feel with that before having to get new bars. Um, this is also a sizing stem that is attached. So given your reach, we can play with your with the length of your stem and then the angle too. Um, so handlebar width important. And then there's also other components of the handlebar too that we need to be aware of the reach. Um, of the handlebar itself um, and then also the drop um, 
now with with gra a lot of how popular gravel riding has become often you'll see um flare in the in the drop too as well um do you feel like there's a big fitting difference between gravel and road bikes they seem i know because visually look pretty similar but is there like fitting yeah. differences for them um yes so often gravel riders t like to be a little bit lower on the bike um like very slightly um so that helps with their stability mm -hmm. um handlebars tend to be a little bit wider to create a little bit more stability so like if i ride a 38 wide handlebar on my road bike you know i go to a 40 on the gravel bike um just because it does create a little more stability but i'm still able to keep fairly neutral um on, on that mm -hmm. um the the q factor or how far your cranks are apart can be a little bit different on on those bikes too so um your stance width might be a little little different as well um so yeah it is it can be can be a little different okay um definitely um road bike to mountain bike is obviously very <laughs> different but to, road to gravel not as much um but there are still some differences like i wouldn't give someone their final measurements for their road bike and be like all right go put these on your gravel bike okay uh, just because there is quite a bit of like geometry differences and, mm -hmm. and some other things too so okay interesting cool yeah um let's see where were we oh so from the frontal view we talked about the handlebar width um and then stance width is a huge factor too as well so going back to cleat position we can move the, on a shimano spdsl we can move about five millimeters in and out which doesn't seem like a lot but that little bit can really make a big difference um and that has to do with your stance width so what I do is I put markers on people's pelvis, um, specifically what's called your ASIS, and then your tibial tuberosity, like the bump in your knee, and then right on the middle of your ankle. And then I give you some laser glasses and set up a laser. And we look from the front to see what your, how your knees are tracking as you're pedaling. So are your knees coming in? Are they going out? are those three dots staying in line with each other? Like specifically, like is your ASIS lined up right with, with your foot? Um, or is your foot kind of stuck out from where your hips naturally are or your feet stuck inwards? So if your stance width is too narrow, very often you'll see at the top of the pedal stroke, you, your knees want to dive out. Um, that can be due to many other reasons though too, um, like if your crank arms are too long, if your reach is too excessive, your saddle is low, all those other things too. So one symptom on the bike can be many, many different things. Um, so vice versa, if your stance width is too wide, your knees will tend to want to track inward from where your feet are. Um, so you'll see like a little bit of like a valgus position of the knee. So that's important to, to know because that can create um, a lot of knee pain, particularly sometimes foot pain too, as well. It can change the pressure of where your feet, where you're, where you're putting pressure through the pedals and can cause foot pain. Um, but very commonly I see knee pain because of that. So um if your stance width is too wide for you you push the pedals out which then move your feet in um and then if your stance width is too narrow uh, it's the opposite so um if you need more than just what those cleats allow you to do um i have um pedal washers so these are one millimeter that you can put on um on the spindle of the pedal um but you really only want to do like usually two is like the max i want to do just because you need to make sure you still have plenty of thread um so then there's also these which allow for 20 millimeters of space um and then also some um pedals themselves will come with um longer pedal axles too as well 
um, Speedplay, which is now Wahoo, did a great job with that. But now that Wahoo bought Speedplay, they no longer offer that, which is a bummer. That's a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the Shimano SPDSLs do um, have one that is, I believe, 56 millimeters versus 52. Um, so there are some out there that allow a yeah. of, uh, longer spedal, uh, pedal spindle length. I heard this thing once before in bike design, how like bikes are a game of millimeters, not inches. Mm -hmm. This seems like bike fits very similar. Mm -hmm. You're talking about like, no, no one millimeter, two millimeters, you're going to make that much of a difference. Yeah, it's very surprising. People are very surprised. They're like, you're going to move my cleat that much and then it's going to make a difference. And then we look at the laser line and we're like, all right, great. Now everything's tracking nice, perfectly up and down. You know, your your legs are like pistons. You're not losing any, any of your power um, and you're not going to develop pain from having things repetitively being pushed out or pushed in. Super cool. Nice. Yeah. Um, all right. Let me see. We're out here. So we can also, also put the questions also as oh, well. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I know I'm sure plenty of you have a lot of questions. So if you look down at the bottom of your Zoom thing, there is the reactions. You can raise your hand. And we'd love to hear from you if anyone has any questions for Laura. Um, I mean, good chance to talk to a professional bike fitter. Anybody? You just unmute yourself and call yourself out too. That works. <laughs> Robert had chimed in um, asking if a a comprehensive uh, fit assessment be completed before purchasing a bike to identify an optimal bike. Yes. So that's that was actually further down in my presentation, <laughs> but I ended up talking too much. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I have a the Wahoo Kicker bike, which I'm able to set up with the same um, geometry as really virtually any bike, especially given that I can put different saddles on my sizing stem, sizing bars, um, so that we're able to set that bike up to whatever bike you're interested in. And typically, I start off with whatever the company recommends for your size. We start with there, and then can can either size up, size down from there, depending on how things look. Um, so um, yeah, definitely getting fit first um, by later can save you a lot of hassle yeah. and money um, to make sure you're going to be on the on the correct um, correct bike. You mentioned before, especially with like direct consumer brands where mm -hmm. you don't really get a touch of the bike beforehand. Yes, yeah, I've been seeing difference. a lot of people like. Uh, that want to buy a canyon bike, um, things like that. Yeah, that want to get sized first. So we do the sizing, and then they bring their bike in once they actually get it, and then we dial that in for them. Cool. Um, Two questions on uh, handlebars. Thoughts on ultra wide handlebars, and also size of handlebars: drop versus straight versus something like the Jones bar. Okay. Um, Thoughts on ultra wide handlebars? Yeah, I mean it depends on what what type of biking you're doing, what your goals are, and then what things look like if you want to try an ultra wide handlebar. Like, are you is that increasing your reach too much on the bike, um, or what is that doing to your shoulder and elbow and wrist angle? I have some people that particularly on gravel bikes, um, th they'll ride a 50 centimeter gravel bike. Um, width bar and um yeah it is a big bar <laughs> and uh but with how they're built and their their geometry um they're they're able to do it and they actually are quite comfortable um on that so just like with everything else with bike fitting it depends um so it can be very helpful or it can be can be hurtful <laughs> um Let's see. So drop versus straight bar. Um, so it depends again on what type of biking you're doing. Um, one thing, like, let's say if you're talking about gravel biking, like if you want to look at a drop bar versus a straight bar. Um, one thing that I like about drop bars and a lot of my clients do is you're able to switch positions of your hands. Um, there's, you know, you can ride on the top, you can ride on the hoods, you can go into the drops. 
um, versus a flat bar, um, you're stuck in that one position. Um, so again, it, uh, it depends on the style you're riding, mm -hmm. you yourself, and then how it, how it looks. Um, so unfortunately, there's not a black and white answer. <laughs> Um, someone else mentioned the Jones bar. Have you seen those the alternative handlebars? Uh, are those the ones that have like the connector between kind them? of, yeah. So they have like almost like it's kind of like a uh, they're bent back a little bit, but then they can also meet they have multiple different meeting points as well. Yeah, yep. I did a bike fit on someone that had that. Um, again, it depends. Um, I don't have a strong preference for any one person. I say like this is you know, the bar for you, especially without looking at them. Um, it would really depend on, again, the style of riding you're doing, your anatomy, how things look, what your goals are. Um, uh, so person one, in. Yeah, they clipped in one. I'm curious about this one too. Yeah, yeah. So I, um, I've done a lot of bike fits with people that just ride flats. Um, mountain bikers and even gravel and road cyclists. Um, some people are not comfortable clipping in. Some people just rather be able to like get off their bike and easily walk and not have a cleat to deal with. So yeah, I, I always say if you decide you ever want to clip in, come back and we'll do the cleat fitting for you um, because that is such a big piece of the bike fit. But yeah, I've done plenty of bike fits with people that ride flat. So Match a similar process, right? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, another good uh, question here uh, is um, about the range of fees for fitting. So, mm -hmm. you know, I imagine, you know, a three hour process probably, it's, pro it's probably not inexpensive, but I imagine there's also probably a lot, tons of value that come with it too. Yeah. Yep. So, um, the three hour process and then it also includes the follow up fit so after riding the bike for depending on how often you ride um, about six to eight weeks we do the follow up fit so that's included in the bike fit so the total cost is 380. Nice. So. Probably, I look at it, it's probably a lot less expensive than months of physical therapy. Yes. <laughs> yes. People spend a lot of money on their bikes. So if you're not, if you're not fit on your bike, but you spend a lot of money on it. Um, and then, you know, if you're having pain, like that's no fun, like biking should be fun and enjoyable. So no matter what, what age you are, or what kind of riding you do. Um, yeah, it's worth it. So yeah, so I think that comes to the question I had for you is, you know, who who is bike fit for? Mm. No, who anyone who rides a bike. <laughs> um, but do you have to be a racer? Do you have to be? No, no, I've done fits for people, um, cyclists in their eighties, um, as young as high schoolers. Um, I've helped people with their bike fit um, that do bike tours. Um, that um, just want to be able to ride, you know, 15 miles without getting saddle pain. Um, so, yeah, it's really for anyone who rides a bike, especially if you're uncomfortable or um, have pain. Um, or on the flip side, I do work with serious racers as well. I've, I've done fits for people that have done like Unbound that have, um, done like race across America, like very high level, high level athletes. Um, and, you know, they were looking to really maximize their efficiency and performance on the bike as well. Um, so cool. Yeah. Really anyone who rides a bike. Um, I know who asked this question, so I'm going to ask it, uh, what leads to Achilles tendonitis on a bike? Ah, okay. Good question. Um, so it can be a lot of things. So if your if your cleat is too far forward, that is going to load more of your Achilles. Typically, um, if your shoe is the correct incorrect size for you, um, that can create instability in your foot and can can cause more strain and stress to the Achilles. If your saddle is too high or too far back, um, you potentially might be pointing your foot too far down, which then is going to load more your Achilles. On the flip side too, I've also seen people that ride their saddle too low and they'll end up dropping their heel and that repetitive um, tension on the Achilles can be irritating. Um, 
so those are the most common things I see that can lead to Achilles synanopathy on the bike. Um, yeah. Interesting. Um, cool. I mean, a couple of questions I have for you if you're still down for yeah. them. Um, so do you have like a usual patient? A usual patient? Yeah. So do you have like a usual client that comes in? You know, is there like a stereotypical one or is oh. you kind of spread the range? No. Um, yeah. I Like I said, I've, I've worked with um, high schoolers all the way up to cyclists in their 80s. So really, really runs the gamut. Um, quite a huge range of um, age, you know, what what their goals are for biking. Um, every Yeah, everyone's different. Mm -hmm. I can't say I have like one specific, like I just see people in their 40s or whatnot. That's not, <laughs> not the case. <laughs> Man, woman, um, yeah, everyone. Cool. And it's, um, you no, know, if you wish everyone can like know, so what do you wish everyone would knew in regards to bike fitting and riding? Like there's like one bit of advice you can give people to like, you make it more comfortable or, you know, mm. from, from a bike fitter's perspective. Yeah. I think people think that because biking is such like a not natural position for our bodies to be in that they think that having pain is normal. But there are so many things that can be altered on the bike. Um, we have, you know, the three contact points, so that our pedals, our saddle, and handlebars, but all those play a role with each other. Um, and there's so many things that can be changed. So don't think that just because you're, you know, you bike that you need to be in pain. I like that. You know, they'd be in pain. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Super cool um well awesome we're almost at time does anyone here have any other questions they would like to ask for laura you can just unmute yourself write a question in the chat uh what's the best time when's the best time to stretch before during or after okay or I, if at all yeah. <laughs> uh definitely some mobility work is good um so if you're going to stretch beforehand you want to make sure that's a dynamic stretch meaning you're not stretching a muscle into its end range and holding it there for like 30, 60 seconds. Um, you want to make sure it's dynamic. So if anything, you're just holding it for like a second. Um, so that would look like, let's say I want to like my hamstrings per se. Um, I could do like a walking toy soldier where I'm like walking, sticking my hand out and swinging my leg up. That would be a dynamic stretch for my hamstrings versus after riding would be when you would want to do more of that static stretching that holding for 30 to 60 seconds so maybe i'll put my foot up on like a bench and keep my chest up and lean forward and then rotate in and rotate out to get the different fibers of my hamstring mm -hmm. that would that would be more ideal for after riding awesome uh laura's presentation was excellent and it sounds like the fit process enables us to be pain-free to cycle pain-free into our 80s Thank you. You're <laughs> um, uh, What expectation is on bike? What expect? Sorry. What expectations on bike fit as we age? So, what expectations do we have with bike fit as people age? You know, do they going to become more upright, probably something like that, or are they going to do? What aspects are going to be changing? Yeah, I mean, it totally depends. So, let's say, for instance, if you have cervical stenosis, meaning where the nerves come out of your neck, there's narrowing. Um, Typically, that's exacerbated with looking up, right? So we probably don't want to get you in a very aggressive position where you're looking up. So yeah, that might mean we need to bring up a little bit versus if you, let's say you have an arthritic hip or an arthritic knee, mm -hmm. um, then we might want to consider like shorter crank arms. So it really depends on what what is going on with you. Um, I'm not every person in their 80s, I'm not going to like put them in a very relaxed position. It totally depends. I have some people that are really flexible um, and kind of surprise me with with their positioning. So it, it it really depends. Cool. And this last question right here from Joanne, uh, is there a seat height error that is most of us make by default? Too high, too low? Yes, loud? very. I'd say 90 percent of the time it's too high. Um, versus too low. Um, so that's one of the most common issues I do see. 
um, people are trying to kind of compensate for other areas that are wrong with their bike fit. So they end up trying to uh, raise their raise their saddle to compensate. Awesome. Good enough. Cool. Well, that just puts us about time. I want to thank you, everyone. I just want to thank Laura especially for sharing all your knowledge. Is there a good spot for people to reach you at if they want to ask questions or book an appointment? Yeah. So my website is uh, pursuitptbike.com. Um, you can book a bike fit right on there, or you, if you want to give me a call and have any questions for me, um, my phone number is uh, 207-200-7267. Um, so yeah, either call or check out my website. Awesome. Cool. Uh, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Laura. We have, uh, so we have a couple more um, webinars coming up. Uh, the next one's going to be on the 24th with Marley Blonsky. She is the one of the founders of All Bodies on Bikes. And then on February 7th, we have one with uh, Adam Craig and Mal Max Southam about mountain bike trail building here in Maine. Uh, they are the builders for Sugarloaf Mountain and Mount Abrams, respectively. So one about big parks coming in. It's quite cool. Um, so, Laura, thank you again. And thank you for uh, Yeah. Come get, come get a bike fit with Laura. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everyone. Catch you all soon.